Executive Director of the Museum, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. This is our ninth annual Webster's War of Words. I don't know if you've heard already, but we're calling 2018 the year of Noah Webster. On May 28th, we will commemorate the 175th anniversary of Noah Webster's death. Later in the year, on October 16th, we'll celebrate his 260th birthday. And today, April 14th, we honor the 190th anniversary of Webster's and American Dictionary of the English Language. I'm sure you're all aware that by joining us tonight, at Webster's War of the Words, you are supporting a treasured local organization and an important local and national institution. Nearly 17,000 visitors come to the Noah Webster House each year. They are entertained and educated while experiencing West Hartford's foremost national historic landmark. The museum inspires young minds and encourages everyone to think about the world around us, to appreciate West Hartford's heritage, and to better understand the founding father, Noah Webster's legacy as the father of American English and the father of American culture. Thanks to your support tonight, the museum is able to keep its doors open um, to the Noah Webster's house birthplace, which was built in 1748, and we are also able to fulfill our educational mission, so thank you. At this time, I'd like to thank some of our sponsors who made this event possible tonight. Our gold sponsors, Reed and Riga Counselors at Law and Tsunami Solutions. Our silver sponsors, Raymond James and Siegler. Our bronze sponsors, Berkshire Hathaway Hoy Home Team, Duncaster Boutique Community Living, The Macaulay and Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And patron sponsors, Keating Agency, Mohegan Sun, Pet Care Veterinary Services, and Thomas Bank Insurance. And thank you also to the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving and the Greater Hartford Arts Council for their ongoing support. I'd also like to thank the many other individuals and organizations that supported tonight's event, which you will find listed in your um, program tonight. Um, in addition, you will find the name of the Webster's Board Words Planning Committee, and I would especially like to thank our honorary chair, Dee Bailey, who I heard has a birthday tomorrow, so happy birthday. It is my pleasure to introduce our host, Miriam Webster's editor-at-large, Peter Sokolowski. Thank you, Pete. Can you hear me now? Thank you so much, and welcome to Webster's War of the Words, a whimsical word game show that, if you'll pardon my gasconading, is an auspicious occasion that begs one to excogitate the aleatory nature of the English language and the circumlocutory way about which Noah Webster went about composing the first lexicon in American linguistics. And with that, let me introduce our celebrity contestants. Uh, our contestants who have generously donated their time this evening, we thank you also for coming by. He is the Shakespeare quoting sports fan from ESPN, it's Rob King on the red team. We have an expert on that other Hartford literary figure, um, Carrie Driscoll, professor at St. Joe's. And someone I like to call the hardest working man in word business from the Wall Street Journal and the Atlantic, Ben Zimmer. Um, the first word this man learned was cookie. Uh, the, the word column is Rob Pife. Someone who buys journals and then never writes in them is uh, another. <laughs> it's Christina Newman Scott. Uh, and finally, a, uh, a wonderful job title, a telepathic cook. Um, an eternal pro pro procrastinator. That means, actually, that she's a poet. Dara Wire from the University of Massachusetts. So this is a straightforward quiz game. Each team scores will be added up by West Hartford spelling champion, Sophie Cudler. And the state of Connecticut spelling champion, Aritra Banerjee. Thank you so much for coming. 
I will see him. I will see him in May in Washington D.C. at the National Spelling Bee, where the words are chosen from Merriam-Webster's Unabridged Dictionary. Um, and so, among other things, I'm giving. I give a lecture on the dictionary on Tuesday night. So I'll see you there. <laughs> Tuesday night of B week. It's a whole week. Um, so this game show will consist of ten rounds with a variety of categories, including a lightning round at the end. Some categories will require your participation, uh, and some will not. So if they do not, please do not. Uh, and I will be, I will cue you when, when, the, when the time is appropriate. Um, all questions are worth 10 points, and so our, our, uh, our, our scorekeepers will be a, a keeping score. <clears throat> um, and this year, each team gets one audience assist and any non-audience participation question, they can ask you for help. Our first round is an audience participation round. So again, if you're a blue table, you work for the blue team. If you're a red table, you work for the red team. The, um, the category is compound words. Words are often paired or connected with other words to create compound words. In this game, the teams will be given three words, and they will have to come up with the one word that goes along with each of those three words. The audience can assist by calling out uh, which uh, they believe to be the correct answer. So the table, as you know, red is red, blue is blue. Only answer for the team that matches your color, unless you're helping the other side. Um, and now keep in mind that these hyphenate, these, uh, these compound words, they could be uh, hyphenations, they could be closed together as one word, and it's also possible that these compound words could come before or after the word that we're seeking. You understand what I'm saying? So for example, if I were to ask for the word that connects, this is just, a, just a, an example for, for, for everyone. Um, if I were to ask for the word that connects with these three words, blue, cake, and cottage, the word would be cheese is the correct answer. Right, so now we understand how it works. So we begin with the red team. And uh, I didn't see the red table answering that question, so right you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to right here. Right here. So we ask you which word, which one word would connect with these three words? Which word would connect with bars, spider, and wrench? Bars, spider, and wrench. Monkey is correct. So ten points for the red team. Again, for now, you, now you see how this works. Okay. So, number two. The words, yeah, still for, we're going to stay with red. The still, the, the, the word that connects with down, poke, and motion. Down, poke, and motion. Slow is correct. Ten points. All right. And finally, I'm sorry, we've got two more. The word that connects with hot, check, and light. Hot, check, and light. Spot. Spot is correct. Ten points, good job. Very fast in the back there. And finally, the last one, tooth, boiled, and corn. Tooth, boiled, and corn. One word that connects with tooth, boiled, and corn as a compound. Weed is correct. Ten more points. Okay, now to the blue team. So the other tables, listen. What word connects with off, drop, and stand? Off, drop, and stand. Kick is correct. Kick off, kick, uh, drop kick, and kick stand. So then the second one, child. Read and water. That's read, R-E-A-D. Child, read, and water. Proof is correct. Child proof, proofread. Uh, ten more points. Number three. The word that connects with hot, strong, and arrow. Hot, strong, and arrow. Head. Head is correct. Ten more points. And finally, number, uh, the last number, the word that connects with bad, students, and language. Bad, students, and language. 
body is correct. We got it in the room and on stage. Body bag, student body, and body language. Very good. So end of round one. Okay, here's the fun part. This is an interesting. Round two is about trending words. And so uh, publishing the dictionary is only part of what we do at Merriam-Webster. Now that the dictionary is online, we also know what people are looking up. And we know that in real time. So we can determine which words are interesting to the American public. Often those words are connected to the news. For example, we had a very newsy week this week. Um, and some of, some of the words that were looked up in the last two days Low life, <laughs> cacistocracy, um, slime ball, <laughs> salacious, and oligarch. And those were all from different stories in the news, and they spiked in our data. They showed that out of the 100 million or so words looked up a month in the dictionary, these were among the most looked up words on those given days. Um, so we're, we're talking about those trends. So that the uh, on online dictionary has become a kind of resource for those trying to decipher headlines, and also to figure out, is low life one word or two? Um, and even though the idea of a trending topic or a trending word isn't new anymore, um, these newsy words have become uh, the most uh, searched online words of a given day. And they're especially popular on social media. Merriam-Webster, I'm proud to say, now has 566 or so thousand followers on Twitter. So thank you for keeping the dictionary in business by using the dictionary when you're curious. In this round, the teams will work together to answer questions about words whose lookups have spiked recently. Unlike in the last round, there is no audience participation, so don't scream out the answer. Sometimes we'll be asking for the word itself, sometimes we'll be asking for the event in the news that triggered the curiosity about that word, okay? So we begin with blue. Blue team, you, can, you will consult, and by the way, it's helpful if you consult into the microphone, so we can all hear your thoughts. <laughs> so rather than huddling together, it's nice to hear what you're, what you're thinking. All right, so number one, blue team. The obscure astronomical term syzygy, spelled S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y, was a top lookup uh, in the days leading up to August 21st as people prepared for what celestial event? Solar eclipse is correct. Ten points for... That, that was a, it's a great word, syzygy. Um, syzygy, which is from the Greek, that means uh, it means the straight line configuration of three celestial bodies, such as the planet, the moon, and the sun. Number two, this French word, word from uh, French origin, means a file containing detailed records on a particular person or subject received national attention at the end of last year when it was revealed that a former British intelligence agent had been hired to compile, compile a collection of research memos. Dossier. Dossier is correct. <laughs> Dossier is correct. Dossier from the French word do meaning back, originally the shape of the back of a chair, which looks like a folder that you carry papers in. All right, number three. The word sesquipedalian, one of my favorite words. Sesquipedalian means given to or characterized by the use of long words. Great word. Um, got some attention when NBA star Stephen Curry used it in a commercial in place of the equine named game, whereby players take turns attempting to duplicate successful basketball shots. What is the name of that game? The answer is horse. You got it. Very good. So that is. Round two for, oh no, I'm sorry, it's two more for blue. Two more for blue, I thought. Lots of these. All right. Here's the question. This word recently in the news to describe a group of more than 1,200 South Central American migrants traveling through Mexico toward the U.S. border. Uh, and is thought of as a reference to a company of travelers on a journey through desert or hostile regions. What is the word that we're looking for? Caravan is the word, that's correct. We have a perfect score so far. Finally, the, the searches on the word glib, glib, skyrocketed the beginning of this past month when the CEO of which social network used it to describe criticism received from Apple? From Facebook. Very good, all right, done with round two for blue. Now we turn to the red team. And 
Reporter Alex Reamer ruffled New England quarterback Tom Brady's feathers when he described which of Brady's diminutive relatives as a pissant, P-I-S-S-A-N-T, which means an insignificant person. His son. No. It was the daughter. I work at ESPN. I'm glad we got one question. Uh, um, all right, number two, number two. North Korean President Kim Jong-un revived a little used and archaic word in the fall when he stated that President Trump was in a, quote, state of, state or period of senile decay. That's the definition of? Doddered. Doddered, D-O-T-A-R-D, from the word dote or doting. Uh, of an older and a person who is in a state or period of senile decay. Ten points for red. Here's a good one. The French word cloche or cloche in French, C-L-O-C-H-E, cloche, means a bell or dome-shaped cover as for a tray or a serving dish. It began trending after it was used in a commercial by this fast food chain which claims to be milk royalty. That was the clue, by the way. <laughs> Sounds like Dairy Queen. Dairy Queen is right. <laughs> so Cloche is like a very fancy butler who would enter with a covered dish and pull the cover off the dish. That cover is called a cloche, much like the hat, which is shaped the same way. Shaped the same way comes from the word bell. Cloche means bell, kind of like this one um, in, in, uh, in French. OK, fine, number four. This term, meaning one that serves as a substitute, was a top lookup in June following reports that Kim Kardashian and Kanye West had recently hired a woman to act in this capacity. Surrogate. Surrogate mother, you've got it, that's correct. Number five, the, this term meaning an idea, principle, or requirement that internet service providers should or must treat all internet data as the same, regardless of its kind, source, uh, or destination, began trending in December when the FCC proposed ending it. What is it? Neutrality. You guys got it, perfect, okay. End of round two. End of round two. So, very nicely done. Back to audience participation. We would like your help with this, this round. This is called Name That Book. We're a, we're a bookish audience here. How many of you have ever caught yourselves reading the dictionary? Look at that. You are true West Hartford residents. <laughs> Um, there are two kinds of people in this world, I like to say. People who read the dictionary and everybody else. So thank you. Uh, in this game, the audience will try to get points for their team, again, blue and red, according to the flowers. Uh, and don't give points to the other team. Um, each contestant has been given the title of two famous works of literature that they will prompt you. They will try to make you guess the title. They will describe the book, but they cannot use the title or the key words that connect that book with its subject. So for instance, if the title were The Red Badge of Courage, the, the, the cues cannot be soldier or civil war or deserter, for example. So in other words, it's, it's kind of like charades in a verbal form. Um, so each team's contestants will take turns describing their book to you, and the team will have a total of three minutes. We have a clock over there. All right. Um, to get the audience. Uh, to get the audience to guess their six books, so two, two, and two, right. Um, and if you are having trouble, contestants, you can just say pass, and it, it will go either to your second title or to the next contestant. Um, and then we'll just come back to you if there's time remaining. Um, and remember, I have the list of words that you can't say, <laughs> and we'll ring the bell if you say it, so don't forfeit the points. So we begin with blue, and, uh, we will be, yeah, we will be, we will begin with Christina. Okay, great. Three minutes, huh? Three minutes, Should I begin? Do both books in those three minutes? Yes. Okay, work with me, people. Blue team, you ready? Okay, great. Tell me when. You may begin. Okay, so this ha um, book, I saw the movie, uh, it starred uh, these young boys who are going nutty on a deserted island, and in the time, yep, that's it, uh-huh, and the next one. Lord of the Flies. Yes, and so the next one, bear with me here. Smeagol. Precious. <laughs> What? Uh, more specifically, though? Yes. Uh -huh. So, all right. You're, okay. Continue. Thank you. 
Now to Dara. Very nice and done. Penelope is Weaver. Penelope. Penelope. Yeah. That Odyssey, the Odyssey. Many a young man's handbook as they gain access to a motorized vehicle and embark on the road. Yeah. They, they got on the, on the road is the title. Yeah, very good. And now Rob. We go to England. Mystery. Solve. Clues. Elements. Sherlock Holmes, that's correct. Now this is a challenge for me, I have to admit. Early feminist. Room of one's own owner. Most famous heroine. We're looking for the title, not the author. Yes. This is Dalloway. Yes. We got it. So, how, how much time did they take? Wow, you did it half the time necessary. You guys are fast. Perfect. Very nicely done. And thank you for those are those are great answers. All right, so now to the red team, and we'll begin with them. Okay, let's do this. Um, three minutes. Okay. We started? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is someone about someone who um, has a secret painting. Dorian never Gray. Gets old. Picture of Dorian Gray. Correct. Okay, this one was the basis for Apocalypse Now. Heart of Darkness. Heart of Darkness. Very nicely done. Okay, Ben, we, ben goes fast. <laughs> now to Karen. Children step into a closet and come out on the other side in another world. <laughs> the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I got it. A young girl goes mad. <coughs> Bell jar. Yes. Bell jar. Very nicely done. All right, and now on to Rob. This female teenage sleuth. <laughs> Nancy True, you nailed it. <laughs> The woman who played Peggy in Mad Men <laughs> was in a Hulu series. Handmaid's Tale, very nicely done, beautiful. So, how much time did they take? One minute and three seconds. So they were faster. Spelling bee is individual. So you can ask Aritra or Sophie, that is your lifeline, but only one of you gets a lifeline. Only because because there's only one only per team. One, on the team. one per team. That's right. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is the this is the last this is the last um, uh, quiz in the first half. We're going to have an auction and coffee and dessert in the intermission. Um, please stay for for part two. Um, and these are all words that were given to students this year in Connecticut's state spelling bee. So these are these are official words that have been used in a bee. And just like the spellers in that B, these contestants may ask for the word's definition, uh, a part of speech, and for a, uh, a sentence. And the uh, and well, um, If a word is spelled incorrectly, the other team will have the opportunity to spell it. You can, you can collaborate on that. Um, and they will get the full 10 points if, if the word uh, flips. So don't forget, you can ask Aritra or Sophie as a lifeline. No audience participation. Don't correct the spellers. But also, just as a, as a spelling bee pronouncer, I also have to give this rule. If you choose to restart the word, that's okay, but you can't change the letters. So for example, if you, if you wanted to restart a word for orientation, that's perfectly fine. You can restart. So if the word were hotel, you can say H-O-T, and then pregnant pause, H-O-T-E-L, that's correct, that's perfectly fine. But you can't correct yourself because if you do, technically you spelled it two different ways, which means one of them must be wrong. Um, so, so you can restart, but you can't re-spell. All right, yeah. we gotta be fair here, folks. So, for the red team, we will, be, we will begin, uh, I'm sorry, red team will begin with Ben. There are two, this word has a variant pronunciation. I always, I try to warn people so that you're ready to hear two different pronunciations of the word gynarchy or gynarchy. Uh, the word has Greek roots and it means government by women. Gynarchy or gynarchy. All right. 
Gynarchy. G-Y-N-A-R-C-H-Y. Gynarchy. That's, that's correct. Very nicely done. So, Gynarchy, a good clue with the pronunciation, like gynecologist, for example, connecting to the Greek word uh, for, for woman. All right, now, this is a perfect question for Kerry, as it happens. Your word is rhetoric. Rhetoric, uh, which originally was a Greek word passed into Latin and then French before coming into English. It means the art or practice of writing or speaking as means of communication or persuasion. R-H-E-T-O-R-I-C. You are a good English professor. <laughs> that was just luck. It just happened to fall that way. And now, Rob, your word is paradigm. Paradigm. Uh, Greek origin, and it means an example or a pattern. Paradigm. I say it's P A R A D I G M paradigm. Correct. Beautiful. All right. So, thank you. Thank you. And now, to the blue team. Starting with Christina. Uh, your word is regime. Regime comes from French which comes originally from a Latin word, and it means the period during which a government or administration prevails, regime. I'd like it in a sentence, please. Uh, <laughs> during the communist regime in Romania, environmental problems were flagrantly ignored. I'd like to ask Sophie. Ah, get, get the microphone over to, thank you. Uh, R, <clears throat> R, E, G I M E. That's correct. I can tell you that in the dictionary, one of the things I like to see is which pronunciations are looked up the most frequently, which ones are the ones that people click on to hear how the word is spoken. And the most looked up words are words like this one that are recent borrowings from French. A word like niche or niche, for example, um, or regime or cortege, words that sort of keep a French accent sort of, kind of, but not totally. And so people look those words up for the pronunciation, um, and we can see that in the data. Okay, now, we are moving on to Dara. Your word is strudel. Strudel is originally a German word, it means a sheet of paper thin dough rolled up with any of various fillings and baked. Strudel. S T R E U D E L. Interesting, that was the German spelling. <laughs> the question is do we accept that? <laughs> in the, in the English... We're not in Germany, I don't know. I think the arbiter has to be, is it in the damn dictionary? Get that fuck out. I, which I happen to have. And the fact is, we do not give it as a spelling. We give strusel with an S-E-U-S-C-E-L, so I'm afraid we spelled it in the wrong language. Sorry, T. But I like, I like your thinking in etymological terms. That is wonderful. Okay. Yeah, I thought we got the chance to explain. Oh, I'm sorry. I only spelled streusel. I didn't spell strudel, so. <laughs> so that's true. In this B, we're giving the other team the chance to spell it correctly. She just added the extra E, right? I don't know. I didn't know Tom Brady's daughter was <laughs> S T R U D E L. Correct. So 10 points for red. Strudel. And Strudel is the one with an E. All right, finally, Rob, the last question of the first half. Your word is cavalry. Cavalry originally comes from Italian, and it means the component of an army that maneuvers and fights on horseback. Can I spell it in Italian? <laughs> Don't spell it in Italian. <laughs> It's funny because I misspelled this word. I wrote a paper for a colonial history class once, and I misspelled this word a hundred times. It was about a Revolutionary War battle, but I think I know how to spell it now. 
C A V A L R Y. That's correct, cavalry, not cavalry. Cavalry. Yeah. Very good. So ten points for. So now, Sophie, you have to give us a, a score reading. One hundred and eighty for red. One hundred and seventy for blue. Now. Maybe uh, Blue can turn it around in the second half. We will have a brief intermission now for coffee and the auction. This is your chance to make final bids on the silent auction. And after intermission, the silent auction will be closed. So this is your last chance for the back row, this coffee. Um, and we will see you in just a few minutes. And we're going to begin with a definition stumper. We have um, two words, one word for blue and one word for red. Uh, two words that uh, we will hear three definitions each for. The three definitions will be uh, those written by the contestants and the real one. So the challenge for the other team is to pick the real definition from among the others. So pick the rose among thorns. Um, and so blue, we start with you. You were given the word bistury. Bistury spelled B-I-S-T-O-U-R-Y. Bistury. And that's not a word I use every day. So let us hear the definitions for bistury, starting with Rob. Bistury. A small room at the entrance to a church where Bibles are kept. A the small room. Oh, should I give, can I give a sentence? Yeah, in, in the sentence. Uh, the parishioner stopped in the vestuary to obtain a Bible before entering the church service. Vestuary, a small room where Bibles are kept. It could mean that, or it could mean <laughs> dark. Vestuary, a small, slender, straight, or curved surgical knife with a sharp or blunt point. The young surgeon lost his favorite mystery in his patient's chest. <laughs> a small surgical knife, okay? It could mean that, or it could mean, Christina? Mystery. A catering tray designed specifically for small bites. Madge used the mystery tray to serve her mini dishes at brunch. A catering tray. Okay, so it is now up to the red team. Don't help the teams. Now up to the red team to decide, does mystery mean a small room where Bibles are kept? Does it mean a small surgical knife? Or does it mean a tray used in catering? So you're choosing Rob's number one, a small room where Bibles are kept. Uh, Rob, can you read what it says on your card? It says, it says, yeah, is that the correct definition? The correct definition? No, 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 is yours the correct definition? I'm more evil than you think. <laughs> <laughs> the correct definition of mystery is a small, slender, straight, or curved surgical knife. So, no points for red. Just, uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, 10 points for blue. Yeah, Very good, nicely done. Nicely done, Rob, and the professional linguist. Yeah. <laughs> Mystery from the French word bistouri, meaning a dagger. And uh, the red team has a word, Austausch. Austausch is spelled actually out, 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 that's and so Ben, with your possible definition. Definition for outdouch. An outbuilding on the domestic premises of a residence as at a country estate. <laughs> and the sentence I have for this is, uh, the strudel was so rich, <laughs> it required a quick visit to the outdouch. <laughs> Nicely done. 
And now Terry's definition, which may or may not be the true one. <laughs> An effect of turbulent motion in the atmosphere that is manifested by an exchange of air and water vapor. In a sentence, the sun's outtouch experienced while flying at 30,000 feet made my ears ring. Uh, an effect of turbulent uh, wind is that, or weather pattern? And finally, Rob, number three, is he, are you evil? Altouch, an act of unnecessary cruelty, behavior exhibited by one who does not care about the pain that that behavior inflicts. Using a sentence, Tom Brady reeled from the outhouse of the radio host who called his daughter and his aunt. Very good. So now, for the blue team, it is your choice. Does outhouse mean an outbuilding or, an, or a fancy outhouse? Um, does it mean the effect of turbulent wind and weather? Um, or does it mean unnecessary cruelty? The blue team firmly believes that it is turbulent motion. And now, that was, that was Kerry's definition. Kerry, is that the correct definition? That's the correct. That is the correct definition. So, and more points for blue. All right, wonderful. So now we have a wonderful, uh, a, a new category. Uh, this requires your participation. It's called Defining the Dictionary. On this day, this is important, it is actually today the anniversary. In 1828, Noah Webster's An American Dictionary of the English Language was published. Um, and it's important to notice that he used that word American in the title. Samuel Johnson had the great famous dictionary in London that was called A Dictionary of the English Language. And Webster very deliberately used the same title, except he added that one word, an American Dictionary of the English Language. And he really kind of, you could reduce his motivations to two with this. He had a political motivation to create a distinctive American variety of English, for which he changed spellings, among other things, as we know. And he also wanted to simplify spellings and make English more logical. And we know that he really succeeded with the first of those goals, because there is an American variety of English that we all recognize. Um, but he actually failed at the second one because English is much more complicated because he was successful. We all are responsible for knowing two styles of spelling. And, of course, English is no more logical now than it was before he got here. So, um, nevertheless, this is the 190th anniversary of the, of the Great Dictionary. Over those years, it's become a household name and made a lasting impression. In this category, contestants will be presented with quotes from writers or celebrities about the dictionary. Each team will be given five quotes, and then I will give you multiple choice answers, three answers, uh, from which you must choose who was the writer who wrote this sentence about the dictionary. And audience, you can help. So perk up your ears. After the quote, I will name three writers or, or names that you've heard of uh, from which this quotation could have come. And you can shout out A, B, or C. The quotation is, life is our dictionary. Life is our dictionary. Who wrote that? Was it A, Ralph Waldo Emerson, B, Henry David Thoreau, or C, Charles Dickens? Life is our dictionary. A, Ralph Waldo Emerson, B, Henry David Thoreau, or C, Charles Dickens? Help us out here. Anyone? Anyone? Uh, it is just a quotation. It is just a sentence that was found in the works by that by that writer. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna go with A. Emerson. A is correct. Ten points for red. Nicely done. Number two. For several years, my lexicon was my only companion. Then I found one more, but he was not contented to be. Uh, he was not content to be his scholar, so he left the land. So I'll read it one more time. For several years, my lexicon was my only companion. Then I found one more, but he was not contented to be his scholar, so he left the land. Was that A, Ed Edna St. Vincent Millay, B, Emily Dickinson, or C, Sylvia Plath? It's still for red, I'm sorry, still red, red, and then we'll switch. B, uh, 
uh, so A, Edison Vincent Millay, B, Emily Dickinson, C, Sylvia Pat Plath. I know. Yep. For several years, my lexicon was my only companion. <laughs> then I found one more, but he was not contented to be his scholar, so he left the land. Last part at all. But yeah, I, I mean, Dick, Emily Dickinson famously had a dictionary. How do we feel about Emily Dickinson? What's up, Yeah, we feel, feel good about that? Yeah. All right, we're going to go with Emily Dickinson. The Emily Dickinson is correct. So, Ooh. 10 more for Red. <laughs> okay, here's the quotation The word romance, according to the dictionary, means excitement, adventure, and something extremely real. Romance should last a lifetime. Was it A, Billy Graham, B, Martin Luther King Jr., or C, Rick Warren? These are good, huh? Makes you think. Yep, so the sentence is, the word romance, according to the dictionary, means excitement, adventure, and something extremely real. Romance should last a lifetime. A, Billy Graham, B, Martin Luther King Jr., C, Rick Warren. Is it like Billy Graham? I think I hear you. Yeah. Billy Graham. Okay, we're going with Billy Graham. Billy Graham is correct, and more points for Red. And now, number four. <laughs> number four, here's the sentence. When we reached the station on the farther verge of the desert, we were glad for the first time that the dictionary was along because we never could have found language to tell how glad we were in any sort of dictionary but an unabridged one with pictures in it. Was it A, Mark Twain, B, James Joyce, or C, Ernest Hemingway? Mark Twain. Mark Twain is correct. Ten more points for it. And of course, a Twain scholar. Again, just luck. All right, finally, finally for the red team. The dictionary, like all the others of the kind, must be left in some degree imperfect. For what individual is competent to trace it to their source and define in their various applications 60 or 70,000 words? Was that A, Samuel Johnson, B, Noah Webster, or C, Charles Merriam? I'll read the sentence again. The dictionary, like all the others of the kind, must be left in some degree imperfect. This is for you, your last one, last question. Right, I'm sorry. The dictionary, like all others of the kind, must be left in some degree imperfect for what individual is competent to trace to their source and to find in all their various applications 60 or 70,000 words. A. Samuel Johnson. B. Noah Webster. C. Charles Merriam. It's a good question. Right, well. I'm just reading the room here a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing. Okay, well, Miriam was just the publisher. I don't know if he had very strong thoughts about construction of the dictionary. Red tables. Any, anybody? <laughs> you think we should just go with Noah? We'll go with Noah. Webster. That's correct. Ten points for Red. Okay, now to the blue team. Nicely done. To the blue team, five quotations. Number one, I love this quotation. The only way to learn a language pro properly, in fact, is to marry a man of that nationality. You get what they call in Europe a sleeping dictionary. Of course, I have only been married five times and I speak seven languages. I'm still trying to remember where I picked up the other two. Was that question from, uh, was that sentence by A, Grace Kelly, B, Jaja Gabor, or C, Sophia Loren? B. Which one? B. B is Jaja Gabor correct? And points for blue. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> All right, number two. Impossible is a word to be found only in the dictionary of fools. Impossible is a word to be found only in the dictionary of fools. Was this written or said by A, George Washington, B, Louis the Sixteenth, or C, Napoleon Bonaparte? It's not Jaja Gabor. 
Impossible is a word to be found only in the dictionary of fools. George A. George Washington, B. Louis the Sixteenth, C. Napoleon Bonaparte. C. You guys feel good about C. Listen, we can't afford to lose any points here, okay? We sh how sure are we about C? That doesn't sound really good. All right, we're C. C is correct, the Holy Bonaparte. Thank and we'll you. Back to blue. Number three. This is dial this is this is dialogue. Don't talk like that, damn you. I find it very difficult. Have you swallowed a dictionary? Please, master, can't please, master, can't keeping ice cool. That's how you ought to talk. We shall have to sack this fellow if he gets to talk English too well. So I'm gonna read it again. Don't talk like that, damn you. I find it very difficult. Have you swallowed a dictionary? Please, master, can't keeping ice cool. That's how you ought to talk. We shall have to sack this fellow if he gets to talk English too well. Is it A, Ray Bradbury, B, H.G. Wells, or C, George Orwell? Have you swallowed a dictionary? A, Ray Bradbury, B, H.G. Wells, or C, George Orwell? All right, come on. I know there's somebody here. Blue tables? Anyone? Blue tables, no. A, Ray Bradbury, B, H.G. Wells, C, George Orwell. You think it's Orwell? All right, we're, we're going to go with C, Orwell. C, George Orwell is correct. Woo from the Burmese Thank days you. in 1934, written about the waning days of British colonialism. Number four, here's your quotation. Take care that you never spell a word wrong. Always, before you write a word, consider how it is spelt. That's spelt with a T. Uh, and if you do not remember it, turn to a dictionary. It produces great praise to a lady to spell well. Was that A, Noah Webster, B, Thomas Jefferson, or C, John Adams? Yeah, the sentence is, take care that you never spell a word wrong. Always before you write a word, consider how it is spelt. And if you do not remember it, turn to a dictionary. It produces great praise to a lady to spell well. A, Noah Webster, B, Thomas Jefferson, or C, John Adams. You think it's Adams? Catherine, what do you think? <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> You're one with Jefferson? It's Adams? Okay, I, that, that's, that's, okay, I, we're, gonna, we're gonna go with Adams. We're gonna go with our people. No, no? The we'll, answer is B, Thomas Jefferson, so no oh. points for blue. It was written in a letter to his daughter, Patsy, good in try, 1783. We have one more. Number we'll five. This. Okay, here we go. Five. I know likewise that writers of travels like dictionary makers are sunk into oblivion by the weight and bulk of those who come last and therefore lie uppermost. I'll read it again. I know likewise that writers of travels like dictionary makers are sunk into oblivion by the weight and bulk of those who come last and therefore lie uppermost. A. Rudyard Kipling, B. Robert Louis Stevenson, or C. Jonathan Swift. I know likewise that writers of travels, like dictionary makers, are sunk into oblivion by the weight and bulk of those who come last, and therefore lie uppermost. A. Rudyard Kipling, B. Robert Louis Stevenson, or C. Jonathan Swift. Swift. That's what we were thinking too, Swift. The correct answer is Swift. Yeah. Oliver's Travels, uh, 1726. All right, we're now at the last uh, round before the lightning round. The last round before the lightning round is called Millennial Speak. <laughs> it is no mystery that millennials have already made their linguistic mark, but sometimes understanding what they're saying is actually hard to understand. Millennial Speak can be seen on any social media platform, heard in almost any song. A handful of these words have recently made it into Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Um, but what do the words mean? In this round, each team will be, given, will be given four questions from which they must select the definition of a millennial word from 
uh, you know, from these cho choices. So they must select the correct definition as a team. You can, okay. you can collude. Have the audience and uh, there is no participation from the audience. However, you still have one audience assist. As a team. And you can ask for help. Okay. So, audience. Do we have a millennial or so millennial? There's a millennial over there. There's a millennial. There's a speaker. Yeah, that's Peter. There we go. So these are, there we go. these are multiple choice. I'm going to give you three so definitions the of the word, and you have to choose the correct definition. OK. The first word is for blue. The first word is trill. Spelled T-R-I-L-L, trill. It doesn't mean A, real, genuine, deserving of respect, or B, recently popularized dance style inspired by Kanye West, or C, code name for marijuana. So trill, does it mean A, real, genuine, and deserving of respect, B, a dance style inspired by Kanye West, or C, a code name for marijuana? Out the gate you come with this one. Wow. It's not easy. Trill. Can you use it in a sentence? I, I can, because that would give the meaning. Like, was that so trill? Like, if you, you know, I don't know what I'm trying to figure out. It's not a dance. I, let's not do the Kanye, because I didn't care about that. I, I think we would have heard about the trill. Um, what's, what's the first one? A, real, genuine, and deserving of respect. B, a dance style inspired by Kanye. C, code name for marijuana. One, two, three. You know, yeah, we're just going to go with A. The correct answer is A. Real, genuine, so 10 point two. All right, number two, the phrase no chill, chill, C-H-I-L-L, -L, no chill. Does it mean A, physically attractive or hot? B, a building, room, or home in which the air conditioner has broken? <laughs> or C, an irrational or otherwise reckless manner? No chill. Does it mean A, physically attractive? B, a hot room? or C, an irrational or otherwise reckless manner. I'm gonna say C. C is correct, C, yeah. C is correct, 10 points for blue. Number three, thirsty, thirsty. Does it mean A, someone who needs a glass of water pronto? B, a shortened ver version of the term Thirsty Thursday in which packs of college-aged millennials head to the bars? Or C, someone who craves attention? C, because I use that in a sentence. C I have is used correct. That in a sentence. C is correct. I actually was interviewed by National Public Radio about this term, and I was just told it will it will air Monday morning on Morning Edition. Yeah, yeah, Thursday. Thursday. On on Thirsty and Thirst Trap. Anyway, number four, your last question. V, the letter V. Does it does it stand for A, a modifier used to identify someone who has gone vegan? Or B, an alternative to the word peace, so named because the peace symbol resembles the letter V. Or does it mean a shortening of the word very, because millennials cannot be bothered to spell out the whole word. Oh my god, that's so obvious, but that sounds like it could be true. But, what, what, hold on. But so A, right? does it mean A, a vegan person, B, peace, or C, a shortening for the term very? Rob's familiar with this one. He uses V all the time. He says it's C. C is correct. Ten points for blue. All right. Now to the red team. Four words. Number one. Number one. Woke. Woke. Does it mean A, culturally enlightened and or tuned in to important issues? B, describing someone who has just woken up in a grammatically incorrect manner? Or C, used as a salutation by millennials to sign up on text messages, as, as in see you later. Woke. A. Yes, we're going with A. A is correct. Well, I knew Ben knew this one. Yeah, 10 points for, for red. Number two, on fleek. On fleek, does it mean A, suffering from fleas used of animals? B, does it mean flawless or perfect? Or C, does it mean in a hurry? Uh, we'll go with B. B is correct, on fleek, flawless or perfect. Number, uh, number three, basic. Basic, does it mean A, lacking personality, style, or, or any characteristics, or B, avoiding drama, or C, disavowing name brands in favor of simple and cheap clothing? Um, A, A is correct, 10 points for red. And finally, SUS, spelled S-U-S, SUS. Does it mean an acronym for shut up stupid? Or B, 
shortened form of suspect, used to describe a person or situation that is worrisome, or C, the way millennials pronounce sauce for some reason. <laughs> a, an acronym for shut up stupid, B, suspect, or C, the way millennials pr pronounce sauce. B. B is correct for 10 points. Red gets the 10 points. All right, now we need a score, a reading of the score before we go on for a lightning round. So, how many points does Red have? <laughs> 270 each is tied. Ooh. Oh my goodness. Okay. All right, so we are skipping over to the lightning round. The lightning round uh, will sort of revise and we'll sort of uh, revisit what we've learned. Each team will have three minutes to complete these 10 questions. I think they're gonna do well. Um, uh, the team will answer them as a group so you, can, you can, can consult with each other and get 10 points for each answer. You can pass on a question and go to the next one um, and it will be repeated if time allows. The, um, and then the final of these questions will be spelling question. And what I mean is I will give you a word and you will have to create new words using the letters of that word. Um, yeah. And the new words have to be four letters or more, just so you don't waste time with, with short words. Four letters, four letters or more. Um, so the last part, and that's the part that will take a little bit, that'll, that will eat up the rest of your three minutes, will be to create new words from the letters of a word that I will give you, a longer word that I will give you. We just shout those out, right? And you just shout them out, and we, and we will count them, and those will be worth uh, one point each. Um, is that right? Yeah. So, for this, uh, yeah, you just one point each, that's right. Okay, so we begin with... What about those other questions? There are 10 points each for the questions, one point each for the spelling, uh, which, could, which could be a number of, any number of words. Okay, so now we're going with red first. Uh, so these can be word questions or uh, questions that relate to the reasons that words were looked up. Number one, we don't want to put a monkey wrench into your travel plans, but the relaxed rules set by the Obama administration to permit American travelers to come and go to this Caribbean nation have since been revoked by President Trump. Is that, uh, and so what is the answer? You can, Cuba is correct. So 10 points for red. 10 points for red. So number two, we wonder if a mystery was used in one of the many plastic surgeries this celebrity and singer has undergone in an attempt to turn back time. We wonder if a mystery, remember a surgical knife, a surgical knife, was share. Share is correct, 10 points for red. Number three, name two recent social movements that have been woke in recent years. Black Lives Matter and That's correct, 10 points for red. Number, uh, number four, Edward Stratemeyer, the creator of Nancy Drew, decided to begin a series featuring an amateur girl detective as heroine after his success with what similar series for boys? Hardy Boys. Hardy Boys is correct, 1927. Number five, the Hungarian-American actress and socialite Zsa Gabor once quipped, I'm a marvelous housekeeper. Every time I leave a man, I keep his house. <laughs> How many times was Zsa Zsa married? for the verb form of this word, popularized by Facebook users, the use of the word when adding someone to their list of designated contacts. Friend. Friend is correct, 10 points for red. In 2016, this actress, who is currently running for governor of New York, portrayed Emily Dickinson in Cynthia Nixon. Cynthia Nixon is correct, 10 points for red. Name three famous nutmeggers, that is to say, Con Connecticut residents, whose names begin with the letter N. So I will give you clues individually. The first is someone we're celebrating tonight. No, that's one. That's one. The second uh, only had one life to give. Yeah. Nathan, yeah. Nathan 
Pale. And the third is best known by millennials for his salad dressing. Oh. Al Newman, you got all three. Ten points for red. And three minutes is up. What? <laughs> all right, so you didn't get to the spelling round. Uh, I think I, the spelling... too much time on Shaja's husband. I think, uh, I think, but the spelling round is important. So we're going to have... Can we do one minute for spelling? And we'll do the same for you. We'll, do, we'll give you. We'll start with one minute clean for the spelling part. Okay. So uh, what we want to do is find letters, words of four letters or more, as many as you can think of, spelled from the letters that are the spelling of ineluctable. Ineluctable. I n e l u c t a b l e. I n e l u c t a b l e. So just shout them out as you as you think of them. Beat, bleat, clue, club, table, cable, cube, cube, uh, bent, bent, time, line, climb, climb, belt, bent, ballet, uncle, auntie. Tunic. Aunt. <laughs> Tunic. Mm -hmm. Tune. Blunt. Bunt. Tine. Bait. And bait. Yeah. Built. Cult. Bile. Yeah. Cute. Yes. Blunt. Loot. Okay, and that's time. So that I see 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 34, 34 points. You have to do some math. I'm sorry, sir, but you have to do math. 34 points. That's pretty good. You guys are good. Oh, God, please. We're yeah. up next. All right, now to the blue team in the final round. Um, so we're going to have a lightning round and then a one minute spell round. So uh, three minutes on the clock? Okay, thank you. So, question number one. Both Peter Jackson's Oscar-winning series, Lord of the Rings, and the Academy Awards-nominated um, The Hobbit series were filmed in what island country in the Pacific Ocean? New Zealand. New Zealand is correct. Ten points for blue. Um, the Celtic uh, punk rock group Dropkick Murphys transformed the song Tessie from a 1902 Broadway musical, The Silver Slipper, into the anthem for what New England sports team? I know, but the song Tessie by the Dropkick Murphys is performed at, uh, for what New England sports team? That's correct, 10 points for blue. Noah Webster may have been the first, uh, one of the first authors to come from Connecticut, but he wasn't the last. Name three other Connecticut writers who came after Webster. Wally Lamb. Yes. Dan Pope. I'm just naming. Yep. Um, uh, Rand Cooper, oh, our Amity Gage, well, she's from Massachusetts. Colin McEnroe, he writes Colin here. Uh, Colin McEnroe, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, right, um, uh, oh my god, um, what, what, Mark Twain. Mark Twain, there we go, okay, we got three. That's ten points for, for blue. Um, number four, The Handmaid's Tale, a dystopian novel about women being forced to serve as surrogate mothers for the upper class, was recently made into an award-winning series on what American subscription video on demand? On what channel? Hulu. Hulu is correct. Ten points for blue. This 1983 hit song by Bonnie Tyler about a celestial event resulting in the total or partial obscuring of one or celestial body by another um, recently made a comeback after it was featured in a children an children's animated movie, Trolls. Bonnie Tyler should have been enough. <laughs> total Eclipse, that's right. Um, ten points for blue. Um, in order to fully understand outtausch, uh, an important phenomenon of the meteorology of the lower atmosphere, it had to do with wind and rain, remember, um, you'd best be a scientist of which kind, A, a physicist, B, a meteorologist, G, a geologist, C, a geologist, or D, all of the above. A physicist, a meteorologist, a geologist, or all of the above. Theater, a, a physicist, B, a meteorologist, C, a geologist, or D, all of the above. I would say the answer is actually all of the above. Um, so now, 
The Napoleon complex, named after Napoleon Bonaparte, is theorized condition characterized by overly aggressive or domineering social behavior. As compensation for what? Physiological condition? Shortness. Shortness is correct. Ten points for blue. Um, this lexical sound has been used since 1945, but Homer Simpson made it far more popular. Don't. <laughs> Don't give him the answer, but yes, ten points for blue. Um, Woodrow Wilson deployed Connecticut's first company governor's horse guard, the oldest actively about time is up. So, okay, um, that was going to be, that's an interesting question, I will read it up to finish it. Woodrow Wilson deployed Connecticut's first company governor's horse guard, the oldest actively mounted cavalry unit, to what, what U.S. border in 1918? The Mexican border, 100 years ago. Okay, finally, so one minute round of spelling for blue. You are asked to spell words, four letters or more, using the letters that spell the word newfangled. Newfangled, N-E-W-F-A-N-G-L-E-D, newfangled. Fang.